Well, I'm Dean Devlois. I'm the writer and director of the How to Train Your Dragon trilogy. Uh, and I'm John Powell, uh, the um, poodle keeper and uh, composer of the How to Train Your Dragon trilogy. Uh, so we're here talking with Kaya, Film Music Media All Access, about what we've been doing for the last 10 years. 10 years? Yeah. It is a decade. It's, it's a being that we work in animation, we work at a really glacial pace, and so <laughs> yeah. uh, we've had plenty of time to get to know one another and, um, and spend far too much time talking about music, creating music, and yeah. applying them to films. Yeah, and um, it's been a, quite a journey. So, well, what do you want to know? Yeah, guys, thank you so much for, for sitting down to, uh, this evening. It's such an honor to have you both here. Um, I'm such a lover of, of the, the Dragon Trilogy and, and Dean, your work, and John, and your work. So, um, yeah, to start, uh, I'll just, you know, let me give people a little bit of a background of each of yours. Um, Dean, I'm kind of interested in kind of how you, be, you know, what was your interest growing up in animation? Is that always what you always want to do? And what was your path to kind of becoming a filmmaker? And uh, John, I know you kind of started off early in kind of commercials and, and stuff. I kind of describe maybe your path also to how you got to where you are today. So. Do you want to Shall I start? Uh, I grew up in Canada, in a small town just outside of Ottawa, on the Quebec side. I could always draw, and it was kind of an escape for me and an inspiration for me. So, comic books. I was really focused on comic books, and I loved, I loved the the world building of it, and being able to sort of control not only the, the layout of the story and how it's told, but also the depth of the characters, mm -hmm. the stories themselves. And yeah, so my goal was to try to get to work for Marvel or DC one day. Uh, but graduating from high school, I had no idea how to connect those two dots from where okay. I was to <laughs> Manhattan. And, um, and so I, I looked around and the only college course that seemed interesting to me uh, that would apply my ability to draw was an animation course being taught at Sheridan College. Mm -hmm which is just outside of Toronto, and I, I kind of squeaked into the International Summer School, which is largely reserved for students from abroad. Um, and it turned out to be everything that I loved about comic books brought to life, which was really interesting. So uh, I had an aptitude for it, but uh, just it, it kind of broadened my horizons. It made the idea of storytelling for a, for a mass audience, for a worldwide audience, yeah. suddenly possible. Wow. And yeah, that, that began the journey, I got hired out of college to work for Don Bluth in Ireland. So right. I spent four, four years in Dublin, my early 20s. What well, uh, was working for Don Bluth like? I mean, I, he's, when I talk about my favorite animated films, I mean, it's his films are like Land Before Time, and I mean, they're all up there. So that must have been they amazing. Were, they were inspiring as a group of people at a time when Disney was making cheaper films and kind of less ambitious films like Oliver and Company. Right. Um, there, was, there was sort of that dearth between, you know. Was this after he left Disney or? Uh, yeah, he had left, he left Disney in the Fox and the Hound days. Yes, right, right, around right. Fox and the Hound, Black Cauldron. He had already made The Secret of Nim right. and Land Before Time and An American Tale, All Dogs Go to Heaven. Yeah. All Dogs Go to Heaven came out when I was in college, and we would look at the character designs and say, like, look, look at Oliver and Company versus this. I mean, I want to go work for them. Yeah. Uh, as it turned out, I, I worked on three of the worst movies they had ever made. <laughs> uh, but it was still a great education, and, yeah. I, and I quickly realized that you can have a talented group of people who are willing to give up their nights and weekends and, and very eager to, to do something of quality. But if the decisions at the very top um, guiding the story are not in very adept hands. Yeah. The whole thing can just end up being an embarrassment, something you don't really want to tell people you worked on. Oh wow. So that was a, a big takeaway lesson of those four years there. So I realized if I ever if I ever achieve my goal of getting into that room mm -hmm. where, where decisions about storytelling are being made, I want to make sure first and foremost that the people that work on the film are proud of it. Right. Absolutely. Well John? Well, well my it's funny I didn't realize my um I kind of have a side swipe into that, which is when I was at college, I got a college, I got a call one day from my composition teacher who who had worked a bit in film, mm. and he said, if you go to Abbey Road, you can sneak in the back and watch the recording of film score. So me and my friend Gavin, who conducts 
right. I think. Abbey we Greenaway, yeah. Conducted all the Dragon scores. Um, we went along to Abbey Road. They led us into Studio One, which is where we recorded this last movie. Wow. And there was James Horner, a young James Horner, recording American Tale. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, <laughs> and it gets even weirder because the engineer there was Sean Murphy, who wow. I use. <laughs> and it was Kathleen Kennedy. Oh, my goodness. Who was producing. And Frank Marshall, oh. <laughs> um, who I... Oh, hang on, was she married to Frank at that point? I think so. Uh, but it was definitely Kathleen Kennedy. And I didn't know it was Kathleen Kennedy. It wasn't yeah. until I was working on Solo and Kathleen said, oh, yeah. Because you know, we were in you know, Abbey Road with Sean and Kathleen and then I was in... Uh, and I'm suddenly realising that it's a kind of a strange uh, elliptical circle it takes to get where you want to get. Mm. It took me a many, many years to get from that moment, you know, watching James doing a, a, a really wonderful job yeah. uh, on an animation film, to back there doing, uh, trying to do a good job on a, an animation film. It took a lot, a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of work and a lot of luck. Uh, but they, the, those moments are those kind of key, uh, key sort of triggers for you. I think. Yeah, for sure. I love that the tradition continues because as we were recording the Hidden World score at Abbey Road, this past November, uh, John was gracious to let all sorts of composing students come yeah. in and watch from that same balcony. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I had, you had to because yeah. it's like, you know, it, <laughs> gotta keep toss the, it on. Keep it, cir yeah, toss keep it the circle forward. going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, uh, did, I think maybe just to, to connect the dots to where John and I met, Chris Sanders and I met at Disney when I started there um, oh, yeah. after my years in Dublin, Ireland. And we were paired together on Mulan. Right. He, he was the head of story. Yeah. I was part of the, the, the blossoming story team. And we immediately had this connection. Like we loved the same movies. We had a similar sense of humor, and um, and, and the same drive to to do something kind of a little, a little fresher, a little more inventive with uh, the story material that we had been handed. And it created this bond that um, kind of lasted through the years. And so. Mulan was an education in, in, you know, making a movie with a large crew yeah. at the, you know, in the hallowed halls of Walt Disney Feature Animation, but also a lot of things that were, could have been done better. And we promised ourselves if we ever get the chance to direct a movie, we we're going to try to w wear as many hats as possible. Um, but even then, I remember even then, I, I boarded a sequence on Mulan that was uh, a largely wordless sequence where Mulan cuts her hair and dons her father's armor and escapes yeah. into the night. And I remember Chris Sanders coming in with a piece of music from Randy Edelman's Come See the Paradise. Oh, yes, And yes. Uh, it was driving and it had this sort of, he was always very music focused and, mm -hmm. and we would kind of trade scores and, and cues. And we became very aware in the beginning, working together on Mulan and then subsequently on Lilo and Stitch with Alan Silvestri and, and throughout working together with John on, on How to Train a Dragon, that music is such an important factor in the storytelling and it can do so much heavy lifting. Yeah, that yeah. We, that it goes places that dialogue just cannot. Everything else is cumbersome, but music has that, you know, that, that, that clean path to the heart. And we began to really trust it and rely upon it and seek out composers who are storytellers yeah. inherent. Yeah. Well, I think it's important to have a filmmaker, I think, like that. Uh, just um, it's, uh, it's all kind of a coincidence, too, because I just went to I filmed a, an event for the Orville uh, with Seth MacFarlane. It's Seth MacFarlane show. And he pointed that out, too, in, in the panel. He has four amazing composers working on that show. And he goes, today, directors don't leave enough room for music and they maybe don't trust their composers or they're not thinking about it he always points he pointed to the shot of course star wars of luke looking at the two sons and you have that moment there where it's just a reflective moment and he he's very conscious of that and i just interviewed alan sylvester uh, a week ago and we were talking about that scene in roger rabbit which i really love which is eddie valiant and it's just panning uh, across his table. He's looking at photos of his his dead brother, and there's no words, and there's just room for music. Do you feel that today that's not as common? I know I know in your films they definitely are, but do you, do you see that elsewhere? Go, oh, they really are not. They're, the, music is the afterthought, but having it baked in that early, like oh, this scene, Alan will take care of it, or this scene, you know, John will take care of it. I, I have trust in him to do that. Is that something you've noticed? I don't know. I mean, I I did get lucky. Yeah, you, you know. got. Yes. I got very lucky. And, <laughs> but the truth of it is, is that you have to step up to the plate. Mm. You know, you're talking about great composers. I mean, look, that the two sons come up, 
Luke's standing there looking at it. Somebody writes, a, imagine if the composer had been a bit shit. Yeah. And writes a really shitty piece of music. You know, it wouldn't have worked. Right, right. Or, obviously the filmmakers would have gone, well, this doesn't work now. We're going to have to cut that out. And, yeah, just know, cut or do the something. Thing. Maybe we should put some voice over. Maybe somebody's saying something. You know, it's like, and lo and behold, it, the, the integrity of the film may have got damaged in a way that couldn't have been brought back. But there are a lot of filmmakers who don't need those moments. They don't use those moments. They don't need the music. Their dialogue is, is so incredibly well done. And perhaps that's part of it, I think. It's not just not trusting composers. Sometimes maybe filmmakers are right not to trust composers to be able to make, make it work. It's, you know, we can all point to these examples of great, great yeah. music, but when it doesn't work, it's like you look at it and you go, okay, right. that's a bit embarrassing. But very often that will, we don't see it because it doesn't work, you get, get, it gets cut out. So, I mean, I think you have to be lucky enough to have everything fall into place. Uh, and maybe that's the trick to it as well, is to try and, you know, it sounds like I'm blowing my own horn here, but I, I really had to work incredibly hard to, to take those moments that, uh, you know, in the first movie that, that yeah. you know, Chris and Dean gave me. The, the you know, Forbidden Friendship famously was, was really, really hard to do. I it's remember not, you mentioning you know, that, yeah. It's like an absolutely exhaustingly nerve-wracking process to get that to work. <laughs> <laughs> and it's one of the most memorable moments of that first film. I yeah, because you don't want to, you don't want to, you know, they put that trust in me. Oh, yeah, yeah, this will be great. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> shit, I've got to do this well. You know, so. But I think it's also a conscious decision uh, early on for us, the, the writers and directors yes, of these yeah. movies, to, to carve out moments that will be propelled by music and not to clutter them with, with dialogue. And sound effects. Let the um, let let the the beauty and the poetry of the music carry the narrative. Absolutely. And in yeah. in the case of animation, it's it's kind of it, it's such a perfect marriage because the animation it allows the animation to sort of rise to that level as well and become poetic and indelible. Yeah. In, in that sense, so we consciously look for moments in the early outlining process of the story to say we we have to guard a good five minute chunk here to just let the audience kind of relax their ears and, and, and be transported uh, without the clutter of dialogue. Absolutely. When you're, when you're writing, uh, do you listen to music at all or is it uh, more of a silent thing? No, I, I certainly listen to music. In fact, uh, one of my go-to bands for the longest time was Sigaros. Oh, yeah, we've yeah. we've worked course. with Yonsi, yeah. uh, largely because I, I don't know what they're, I don't know what the lyrics mean and right. in a lot of cases they don't really mean anything. but. Um, that just allowed the visuals to transpire. Yeah. I get into the habit of listening to soundtracks anyway, um, along with Chris Sanders going back to Mulan, like we were saying. <laughs> it, it just puts you in the headspace, you know? It's you what got on... me into filmmaking, because I'm not a musician, but that's how I got, I mean, pushed yeah. me into film school and everything. It's, my dad had, a friend had a record store in D.C., and they would bring home the samples, and I'd pick out the soundtracks, and that's how I kind of... So, oh, like, who, who's this name? Oh, that's a movie I saw. Okay, and you started piecing together, and then when you're listening, when you, you know, backseat with the Walkman, and just, you know, <laughs> just images going by, you start building scenes in your head. So that's kind of how it all started, at least for me. But, yep. and my mom says the first movie I ever saw was Fantasia. That might explain something, but I don't know. <laughs> Probably did have a big influencing factor. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but we had our go-to's. You know, you'd you'd throw on the Terminator if you wanted a, <laughs> this sort of driving dun, serious dun, dun. <laughs> action scene. But then I, I went to, one of my go-tos was back in the day was Rachel Portman. Oh, yeah, you know, beautiful. A lot of her very lyrical, kind of magical, lulling pieces. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so let's jump into uh, How to Train Your Dragon and that first film, kind of rewinding back 10 plus years. Um, how do you remember... Uh, coming together and meeting each other, and what were the first conversations you had about music in the film? I, I seem to remember, I, I, my memory of how long it was between meeting you guys and actually the film coming out is, sorry, my memory of that moment differs depending on, <laughs> you know, if I think back, it was either really surprisingly close, or it was plenty of time, it was maybe 18 months or something. I think, were, it, I think in your world, it probably felt about um, prob like, like a standard amount of time because as you've confessed to me, you like to wait, wait as long as possible. Yeah. So we, yeah, for us, it was a very hurried process. I'm, Chris I'm, Sanders and I came on replacing the second um, 
version of the movie with the second set of director and writers. And there were there were only about 15 months left oh, between wow. the moment that we oh. took on the project and its release date. So we had to very quickly reconfigure a story um, from page one, oh but use a lot of the elements that had already been designed and built, sets and characters, yeah. and change as little of that as possible because there wasn't a lot of time. Uh, with with the, the project we were inheriting, certain certain key figures were already in place. A lot of the cast was in place. John was in place, uh, Randy Tom. Um, so we had we had these amazing people already cast onto the film and we hadn't worked with John, but we were very familiar with his work. And right. so we looked forward to meeting him and talking about how we wanted to design a, a movie that had some strong iconic moments set aside for music. And um, I think we had that conversation we probably shared with you like a, a full draft or two and invited you to an early screening but I remember John telling me I thrive on the you know on the momentum of um, of you know the panic and the, the, the driving <laughs> deadline and so uh, which I understand in the same way like I've always been the kid who if I had two weeks to write the, yeah, the high school paper I waited until the <laughs> night before <laughs> do you think that's when the best decisions come when you have to just not think about it and just go with gut instinct well Yes, but there's more to it, I think. I've been mean, trying to analyze this over the years. And I think, you know, in the two weeks that you're spending not writing it, you are you're blocking off the routes that you know you mustn't take that won't work, maybe, or that aren't giving you something. Or you're, you are looking for that route, and maybe not in a really conscious way. That's true. But I think there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the background so that you, you think of it, you're, you're thinking about it whilst not looking at it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember George Miller told me that that's how he would shoot scenes. You know, he would he would just kind of look at it. He would say he'd shoot scenes often what he called out of the corner of his eye. Um, and I, I thought that was a really interesting way to try and get your intuition. And and T. Burn Bonnet as well. He was telling me that he he records like that. He produces like that. He puts a band. He casts the right band. Puts them in a room, and he stands outside, and waits. Just waits until something interesting happens. So a lot of it is about waiting for things to happen. Um, and of course, the force of an oncoming deadline really makes you make decisions as well. I think that's part of it. And yeah, I, I've always said I, I, you know, I get paid five bucks to write the score and a million dollars to stay calm. <laughs> 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 you know, so um, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, all, there's so many really good composers around, and some thrive under this, under those, under, under all the other circumstances that are needed for for the gig, and some don't. Some really don't like it, and they, they you know, so and it, sometimes you can avoid that kind of pressure by being very organised and and the right. But you have to write, find the right filmmakers, perhaps. Yeah, I don't know. You've always seemed incredibly calm, even on that first movie. There was no, I never felt like, you know, and I've been on movies where everybody is like shitting themselves about everything and you know considering the the way that it, you came on late and everything was the boat a very big boat had to be turned very quickly and you didn't know me and all that kind of stuff I mean I, I just think it was it was interesting that that uh, you know even at those last minutes I remember you and Chris basically saying you know Jeffrey would be like this cue is shit, throw it out. <laughs> and then he'd go, and then they'd say to me, we actually thought that was quite nice. You should just maybe work on that a little bit longer. <laughs> Which, under the circumstances, have had the head, head, of the, head of the studio kind of like, you know, not happy with something. <laughs> Normally, everybody would go into a panic. But you guys just were like, that, it's, 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 that's, there's some good stuff in there. You know, just keep working on it. You know? And I did, thankfully. And, it, and, and uh, several weeks later, Jeffrey would have loved it, loved it you know, eventually. So. Yeah. But didn't, he, didn't Jeffrey, I love Jeffrey, didn't he, doesn't he famously admit that he wanted uh, Staying Alive in uh, Lion King for Timon and Pumbaa's? Oh, really? Yeah, I remember reading something where he's, he was like, oh, we need to get Staying Alive in there. And he's like, no, it has to be an original. It can't have, like, pop culture reference or something. And later he admitted, he's like, yeah, I was totally wrong. <laughs> oh. he, he, he was always great at admitting when he was wrong. You know, <laughs> it just took a little time sometimes. <laughs> you know, but he was also very, very good at and very quick at pointing out when I was wrong. He loved to do. <laughs> and what's really great is that John captured, because John would always record the sessions when we'd, he'd come in to play back things and, yeah. and get notes. And so he had made sound bites 
out of Jeffrey's <laughs> insults. Uh, yeah. uh, he was able to pull them up and you know, Soundboard. play them back. Yeah. So if you need some inspiration. Push the right button, fuckhead, was one of them. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the other was, John, you mumble. You mumble in your British. It's a bad combination. That's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember on Ants, um, the, the, the scene on Ants is the, the, when they all went off to war. Yeah. Um, I, we were talking about it. I said, how about something like this? And I kind of immediately got a bit of Britain's war requiem. Okay. And I kind of like put it to the picture. It's like, this is a really heavy piece. Yeah. It's a brilliant piece, but a yeah. very heavy piece. Like, and it was so fucking serious. And I remember <laughs> directors and Jeff, I think the directors, Tim, looked at Jeffrey and Jeffrey said, you know, John, I, I get where you're going with this, but this is for fucking kids. <laughs> <laughs> Because I think they ended up with like ants go marching one by one. Yeah, exactly. a much better idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, once the the process on that first film got going, um, John, when did you? I mean, that 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 central theme for the first movie. Do you remember what inspired it and when that came to be? I mean, that's that's something you you we could actually credit Jeffrey with. He was very specific mm. about wanting something that felt um, Celtic. Mm. You know of the of the, yeah. the Scottish and Irish folklore, yeah. um, and and so that helped target it a little bit because totally, it certainly yeah. spoke to your background and yeah. And and our, between him saying that and Bill Damaschke, I remember saying to me, you know, it would be great if we weren't, you know, completely old fashioned about this. Mm -hmm. And that was actually when I went off and wrote Test Drive, huh. was because of because Bill. I remember thinking, I, really, I should. I shouldn't just be very classical about everything in this. Maybe there's a way of kind of bringing heavy guitars and stuff into it, which seems kind of a, a weird idea for a Celtic thing. But I was thinking of, you know, U2 and, and Simple Minds and all these kind of things from my mm -hmm. history, um, and Muse and things like that. And, and I remember there, there's, I thought there might be a power to it. Yeah. And, and that, that seems, scene kind of spawned that. Um, I also remember meeting with you guys and um, for the opening, and and you were just saying, just make it lots of themes, well, thematic, very thematic. You really were telling me not to worry about trying to just, and it, it's a really important rule, which is you know don't score what you can see necessarily. You know, yeah. If you can see it, why why am I doing the work as well? Right, right. So just try and so that opening, the whole opening scene was all about. It took a while to get the very beginning, this, the the zoom in over the sea, but I think quite early on I managed to get kind of a nice little suite of all the themes for mm -hmm. everybody going right in the first battle, as it were, because there's dialogue through it. Yeah. All the time. So and I. You know, I was watching the, the live action, the live orchestral score being played to the film, which they're now doing all around the world. Um, and uh, it's great because it works extremely well, except for the fact that I wasn't dipping for any of the dialogue. That, we just did that with a fader. Yeah. So when an orchestra is blasting away and a big orchestra is blasting away, and they're trying to mix the, <laughs> mix the live dialogue you know, in the film, because people are sitting and watching it, they can't really, so they put up sound. They put up um, subtitles because <laughs> it's like you can't really get the orchestra to dip like that. Because yeah, yeah. I've got everybody roaring away, which is fine in the film, but you know, so. it's a real that sequence. The opening sequence is a real challenge for John, but it didn't work until John's music was applied to it because mm. it felt really chaotic. You know, we were introducing so many characters and Hiccup's ambition and all yeah. of the different dragons that they were threatened by in this way of life and peripheral characters. I mean, it was. It's a lot Stoic. of information. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It has a lot. Um, it has a lot to accomplish, but the music kind of unified all of it and made it yeah. sort of lyrical and 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 somehow brought a sense of um, direction to the chaos. When you're when you're kind of uh, planning a scene out like that, are you? I mean, are you using temp? In, did you give te John temp, or was there no temp in this? We always use temp. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but you have, um, to. You have yeah. to. But and I don't have to listen to it. That's the trick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we used a lot of John's temp from um, particularly like the Bourne series. Mm. And yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> in the training sequences, uh, there's yeah. a lot of Bourne music that was used as temp. But yeah, he, he you know, he, he's let me know on all three films that he would prefer to come in and listen to it without any temp at all, uh, which is 
excruciating for me, right? Yeah. Because yeah, it feels so you naked. You suck everything out, yeah. Uh, and, and so much seems to not work without music helping you along. But, you know, he sits there and I think cues are coming to him as he's watching. So it's a different mindset entirely. Yeah, I do hear. I mean, I, it's quiet, but I can hear stuff. And, but if there's music in there, it's got, I just I have no imagination. I just become a, I become a kind of a receiver of yeah, the film audience, rather, right. rather than actually be able to sort of be inspired by the film, which mm -hmm. is, I think, wonderful. And that, that's purely from reading an interview with um, uh, either Jerry Goldsmith or, or um, I can't remember, maybe John Williams actually as well. Mm. You know. So uh, you're, you're mentioning uh, the test drive scene, which is, I mean, that's the first time we hear that, that full theme and the guitars and everything. And uh, that uh, when you're kind of building up to those moments and when you, it comes time to spot those moments, like how do you kind of keep the structure? Like, are you planning out like, oh, this is a good time to reprise this theme? Or, or do you have like a map of sorts of when you're planning that out? Or is it just kind of as it's I coming? I would have to tell you that it's all very <laughs> organized, but it... <laughs> It is not organized at all. It's, it's, it's throw, throw your underpants at the wall time and see what sticks as it is, you know, or spaghetti. I can't remember what the thing is. You know. I like underpants better. Yeah, if you throw spaghetti at the wall and it sticks, it's right, you know. So you just, I, you throw things out there um, and just see what happens. I mean, and obviously the, the idea is to do as much of this embarrassing sort of work on your own without right. anybody having to see it. But I mean, as, as we've got kind of closer and closer to sort of knowing each other better, I think uh, I've, I've always felt, you know, I can show you things and, and uh, even at an early stage, even if there's kind of just a sort of something about it, I just want to see, does it smell right? You know, um, I, I love to do that early with, with, with the, my, you know, my filmmakers, because then you get this sense of, I mean, sometimes people can say, Oh, I see what you mean. It's 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 got that kind of sexy feel, and you're thinking, "Oh, I wasn't going for that." <laughs> yeah. And you can suddenly realise, "Ah, okay, right." And then you change the tempo, and it's, "Oh, yeah, yeah, it's got a driving feel." Mm. Now, okay, so now we're this, yeah. so, and that saves you from writing the whole thing, trying to structure out, and essentially your 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 structure, your the foundation of it is is wrong, mm. you know. And then it, it's better to try and creep up to it, but you don't want to creep up too much with the chaos that is early work because it's very hard for everybody to sort of imagine. Here, I want you to hear this kind of, um, this exploding, um, you know, sort of, this is me smashing watermelons with hammers. What do you think? You know, it's, it's very hard for people to understand sometimes. But, uh, you know, that was one of those things where I would have played just the initial idea, just kind of, okay, here's just 30 seconds of this thing. What do you think? Yeah, I think. I mean, we sort of uh, played it for everybody, and everyone went, "Yeah, that's kind of that's great. It feels like flying. It feels strong. It feels powerful." And I didn't really have it structured out. I don't think at the time. I probably said, "Okay, well, next week I'll have something." So I, with that go ahead, and you look at it. You go, "Okay, well, I'm, I need to do a B section, and then that will allow me to, you know, to to recap." So where should I recap? So then you fiddle around trying to get the piece to recap in just the right place that gives you that kind of sense of thing and a key change and all the, those usual sort of things. But uh, if you don't get a chance to just play with it to begin with, I, I don't know how you can, I mean, I'm sure some people can go straight to it, but. Mm. I think I had a clearest, the, the clearest sense of, of um, how John works came to me on, on this last film where he would play ideas, tunes, mm -hmm that didn't necessarily belong to any one sequence or might he might play as a background some of the imagery from a sequence, but um, no conviction that the tune actually belongs there. It's just something that right. felt right. The atmosphere felt right for the themes of the story. And, uh, and it, it's interesting because it's, I can draw a similarity to how we work. You know, oftentimes we have a moment we really like and we think, Oh, this this would be a great sequence to include it, and it just kind of rejects it in a mm, way. Yeah. And so you try to find some other spot for it, and oftentimes it just sort of drops out. And you think, okay, I'll use it in another movie one day. <laughs> uh, he played a, a tune for me on this film that, that I loved, but there was no place for it in the movie. And I thought, like, okay, we got to find a way of wedging it in there because it's so good. But you know, I'm sure it'll appear in another John Powell <laughs> score in the future. Uh, so I, I think it's quite interesting that. Um, 
that yeah, it's not driven by the imagery. It's sort of driven by a, a larger thematic sense, yeah. which comes through John's prism, and and he he understands the story in a slightly different way than I do. Mm. Uh, he'll read the script, he'll see an early screening, and he'll begin to draw his own kind of thematic through lines, which actually, in the best possible way, wake it, work as harmonies to what I'm dealing with on the surface level. Right. Um, that the 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 big finale of the first film that's that was a momentous i mean third act there was i think it was like music kind of stretching that entire scene all the way through um well i mean was that was that a tricky thing to do or was that kind of simple because did you when did the process did that come at length is that yeah, chronological it was really <laughs> i just knocked that off in a couple of days <laughs> no <laughs> that was squeezed out at the end of the toothpaste that one really uh, i don't know i mean the funny thing is i remember huh? going to a preview with you and, and watching the film. And uh, it was really good. It was really good. And everybody loved it. And we went for sort of dinner or something afterwards. And, um, and you were basically saying, there's something wrong with the end. This was before uh, Hiccup lost his leg. Oh, yeah. Um, something wrong with the end. It's not working. I remember thinking, it's perfect. What are you talking about? You know, <laughs> and I and then I think a few weeks later, later I got kind of, I got that you know you'd put that shot in probably or a rough of it you know, and I, I was really kind of, oh my god, this is absolutely the way to do this. I see this. I would never have seen it. I, I, you know, it was one of those things where it felt, that's finally it. and that, that probably opened up how I was going to get. It. it it made us such a difference. I wouldn't have, I'd never have been able to write that sequence, I think, because I wouldn't have known where I was going until that came about. Now I knew exactly where the story was, the arc of the story. So the whole end sequence was, was moving towards the end of that. Um, and, th and that's the problem with, you know, as the film moves under you, you might not understand. I don't suddenly, sometimes I don't understand what the f story is doing until it's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you're in this kind of iteration, iterative process sometimes. How often does, because uh, I know I talk to, I mean, composers who work on big action, live action films, and they go, you know, something like when I talk to Steve on Transformers, like the cut is always changing every 24 hours. Is it similar in animation? Is a cut constantly changing? Or is it kind of, once you have a locked picture, it's pretty kind of there? Uh, that, that probably varies. Um, from filmmaker and studio to studio. Um, I, I've worked on projects where at the last minute entire sequences were jettisoned and we had to you know conceive and storyboard and rush through animation a new sequence. Oh wow. Uh, long into the process of kind of where everything should be set and, yeah. and the composers working away which I can only imagine would be very frustrating for the composer but we at least on these three films um, we, we took the ample time that we had to make sure that by the time we invited John into the process, it, w it really was starting to set. Mm -hmm. And timings would change, and as we'd go through, we might have to delete scenes in order to kind of bring the overall time down. But no major pivots uh, that I can think of that, that you had to endure. No, no, because I, I, I like that one pivot we're talking about. This was so early enough that I hadn't written the scene, certainly. And uh, when when do you come on board? Are you, are you, is it, it an ani animatics? Or are you l looking at that? Or are you waiting until there's kind of final animation? As I mean, I try and get in as late as is sensible. Mm. Again, so I, I kind of offer up. I try and offer up my um, my virginity <laughs> to the filmmakers, as it were, <laughs> um, so that I can I can be fresh and <laughs> and see things that. Perhaps everybody's a bit jaundiced about. Yeah, you know? I mean. it like you know? <laughs> I remember watching Shrek. Uh, Harry and I went to watch Shrek, and you know, everybody. I was like a. It was a screening just at DreamWorks, just for internally, and um, <laughs> everyone was looking ashen. You know, <laughs> everything was just like hell for them, absolutely. And they liked it. Oh, here's the film, and Harry and I were like, "This is fucking great." <laughs> You know, and everyone was like, what do you mean it's great? Said, it's great. I've got nothing to worry about. <laughs> nothing to worry about. <laughs> they didn't believe us. Uh, but, you know, it was obviously working. Um, and that's great because you come in and you sort of get to see 
the film as the audience mm -hmm. will experience it. You get to experience it that way, and then, all you can, then what you can do is you can then remember the ride that the film is giving you, mm. and you can try and keep that as a sort of a compass mm. for, for, um, for everyone. And even, even when the, you know, the film, filmmakers are, you know, are sort of in, you know, say, well, that isn't what we meant, what they meant sometimes is not necessary with, with all of us, especially with music. It's like what you mean is not necessarily what sometimes is there. Right. You know, and I'm, it might not be what they meant because the music isn't bringing out the right thing yet, which is then it's my job to actually do that. But it also sometimes is they didn't realize what they'd done. And, and if I bring out that tone in it, suddenly it brings a whole new sort of um, dimension. Piece, dimension, yeah. yeah. That's very exciting, I think, for me and f sometimes for the filmmakers when, when we can actually see, see things that um, you didn't realize were there. Yeah. I mean, is it important, Dean, to have that? Do you get, like, after seeing something, like, 300 times, do you need, a, like, a second pair of eyes to, like, tell you if it's working or not? Yeah. It, yeah. It, it's essential to have that freshness, yeah. <laughs> which, which I think by, by John sitting it out as long as he can, yeah. he does bring that, that freshness and urgency and clarity to the end to what is forming the end product right um, and like I, I've come over the years to trust John's judgment implicitly in, in that I had strong opinions about what the music should be sort of partly based on the temp partly based on sort of my myopic view of what the sequence was intended to be within right. the larger structure and he would surprise me sometimes by coming in with a cue that was you know, it might be an action scene, and he was in, in underscoring some emotional um, tragedy. Right. Uh, and I'm like, w what are you doing? It's supposed to be driving. And then, and then I sort of take a step back, and I realize, oh, I get it. Like, you're bringing, you're bringing dimension to something that, that was, was very one-dimensional. Right. Uh, so I love that. You know, I, I think it's, that's where I, I began to sort of embrace John's storytelling sensibility as, as a crucial part of the team. Would you say his, your trust in him kind of, by the second film, were you kind of a little bit more hands off or? Yeah. Just kind of changed by the second film? Yeah, and even by the end of the first film. It's just my knee jerk reaction. And I was so embarrassed in the beginning. I, I, <laughs> I apologized to John. I said, I don't know any music terminology and I have no education in music. And, right. Um, so I'm going to sound like a simpleton a lot of the times. Uh, but. Which you probably, you probably prefer, right? <laughs> I do. I mean, the, the idea of you having musical terminology is actually an anathema to what really a film composer needs. You, right. sh you shouldn't have to do that. You should be just emotionally reacting to your film, the music, how it's working on a, just a story level. And, and all of this other thing is my, should be my, in theory, my, my job to translate. So, you know. Yeah, yeah. he did tell me he, he preferred that. And he also... Uh, you know, he, he kind of, I would drive him crazy in the sense that I'm always looking for a hummable, memorable mm, tune. Yeah. And I might feel like, like something partially formed in an idea that he was playing back to us. But I think that's, if I'm a broken record in any way, it's always like, I, I like where it's going. I just wish I could <laughs> walk out of here tapping my toe and humming it. Yeah. Uh, and so I am very, very much a, a sort of a simpleton in that regard. <laughs> no, no, you, you, you are like, you know, 99% of the world is that you, you know, you want something to grasp onto that has a kind of a structure that you can see within, within, you know, a f really a few seconds. Of, and, and Jeffrey was always like that. Jeffrey d obviously was much ruder about it, <laughs> <laughs> but absolutely dead on almost always. As well, you know, so there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> um, but Dean, do you find it difficult to, to, I mean, when you guys are working together and you guys are friends and you respect each other, but do you have to bring up this criticism? Is that difficult to direct your composer and be like, this isn't working? I mean, or is it, is it I, understood? I don't think so. I mean, I, I come from the Disney story department where part of the job is that you go back and revise over and over and over again, but you deliver constructive feedback in a respectful way yeah you know so that you're not demoralizing somebody and you're not sort of calling them out or humiliating them or making them feel like they're inept mm. it's yeah. it's more about like you you approach it with this is how i feel right know? right or uh, you kind of identify the thing you like and wish there was more of it or this part kind of confused me or and it, it, then it's just a dialogue yeah it's a dialogue and I, I learn what's important to him and he's hearing what's important to me and and then i leave it in his hands to 
to consider it. Right, right. And I've been swayed many times, you know, where something didn't feel right because I had, uh, I just had a preconceived notion of yeah. what the sequence is going to be. Um, it became something else and something better by, you know, by understanding that, that the dimension John was bringing to that particular sequence gave it, gave it a, a deeper texture. Wow. So let's, moving on to the second film, this is, you had a little bit more breathing room this time probably, right? And um, so once the first one was doing great, you got probably the call for the green light for the second one. Um, what was that, what was your, both of your, each of your approaches to sequels? Because um, I think everyone could be daunting, like, oh, are we going to do the same thing? Are we going to, how are we going to make it different? And at that point, was the trilogy already planned? So, uh, no. Uh, what, what happened first was following the success of the movie, critically in box office, uh, Jeffrey asked me to come up with ideas for a sequel. And I quickly expressed to him my lack of interest in, in sequels in general. And like, I, 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 I distrust them. I'm often disappointed by them. Uh, and they, they feel they lack purpose in a lot of cases. So, right. so I said, the only way I would be interested in having this discussion is if you would be open to a trilogy because it falls then within a structure I understand it's three acts of one three story structure, yeah. and we could go from Hiccup who was the the nuisance runt couldn't do anything right to wise selfless chief by the end yeah. but it would also contain within that uh, a very inspiring idea brought to me by Cressida Cowell which was she wanted to explain what happened to dragons and why they aren't here anymore in our right. world right. by the end of her 12th book and I, and I said let's let's take that on so not only do we see our hero flourish and and mature, but he will also, in the process, have to let go of the thing he holds dearest. And and that felt like a challenge to me, and it immediately had this sort of wonderful, bittersweet quality, which I always love about. Yeah. It's, it's a theme I love in movies, where you have disparate characters that are brought together, and they yeah. they their time may be short-lived, but the impact is is indelible and, and profound. And should they part ways, they'll never be the same again. Uh, that that fed into this larger idea. So I got excited about it at that point, but it meant committing to two two movies, not just one. And that's a big and, chunk of life. Yeah. <laughs> so Jeffrey had had faith in the, in the the endeavor, but yes. he also warned me. He said, if if two doesn't work, there is no three. So just <laughs> make a good movie. Oh wow! So there was the risk of it. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it, was pen, it was pending on how well it, it did. Uh, if there's still interest in it. Mm -hmm. exactly. It's it's the movie business. It not is a the business. movie charity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, John, when you came on board for the second one, how how what is your approach to sequels? You've done a couple now. Um, you have all these themes that people love and probably expect to hear but do you treat these themes as like oh i have some tools or is it like baggage weighing you down because you want to try something different no it's 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 sort of both mm -hmm. uh, it was actually an experience that i heard about from through from danny elfman uh, spider-man 2 i mean he wrote a brilliant score for spider-man 1 and they and they tempted a lot in spider-man 2 then he wrote this brilliant score for spider-man 2 but by that time it's kind of set mm. they'd already tempted all with spider-man 1 yeah and he, it was very frustrating for him, I think. And I remember that experience led me to think, um, I'm going to talk to Dean at this party while we're all drunk and see if I can persuade him not to temp number two and number one. And you very kindly said, I will do my best. I will do my best. <laughs> and I think you did, almost to a fault in the sense that people were like wondering why <laughs> there was no Dragon's One in it as much, you know, in the temp. And there was all these other kind of crazy things in there. Right. And it was, and, and Jeffrey was like, uh, you know, I remember doing one cue and Jeffrey was great. Thank God we're not having to listen to fucking Batman in here. Or whatever it was <laughs> like that, yeah. you know. And it, it, it's not, it wasn't just to sort of keep it out of everybody's view so that they don't, you know, so I, I have problems with it. It was so that nobody else misunderstands what we could do with the themes. I was, right. I was really was keen to be able to have some hand in making sure that the thematic material was connected in the right way. Um, because I was really hoping for a tri trilogy as well and, the, and you know I needed this all to keep going. So as, uh, as we're working on two, we, you know, we, I did want to write material that would, that would keep going. 
and, and be useful as part of a bigger story because I mean you were talking to me about the third episode even then and you know even though it changed I think we, you always knew kind of where we were going and so we had to so hence I mean you know I think that's probably I'm, I'm a bit praxis sometimes I work out why I do things afterwards mm. which I guess is just you know, having more going on at the back of my brain and then the front um, and so you know the whole idea of lost and found was actually going to be very useful as we as we got sort of to the end mm. um, so that that second movie you know finding the father losing uh, finding the mother losing the father was a kind of a, a maturing but it was also it was where we really were going we were going to lose everything we were going to find everything um, so you know those are the kind of um, those are the aspects of of having I think a, a chance to do sort of long form storytelling which I, I you know I think has been great on this actually mm -hmm. I mean, it really is being good. I mean, if you look at actually what's going on, I think in you know Game of Thrones, that's really the ultimate long storm form storytelling. I mean, I think we got a chance to really have a go at that as well. And I, you suddenly realise how much more satisfying it is than trying to d say everything in one movie. Yeah, um, absolutely. That's why we. I mean, I think the third one we we managed to bring it into land, you know, with a lot of satisfaction. That was our thing was like make sure that everybody's satisfied. Mm. Yeah, and so much so much of what goes on with sequels is that they they seem to operate on the surface and that you have the same cast of familiar characters cast into another random adventure right that, that doesn't seem to further or deepen your understanding of the characters and and lacks a sense of purpose of oh we're in the middle of something greater mm -hmm. and that it must culminate uh, so we did we did try to pull back and say you know what's the larger architecture of these three installments, how do they work together, and how are they carrying our characters to some inevitable end? Absolutely. Try to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. And John mentioned the lost and found element. That that was that came from uh, a, a discussion where I had involved him fairly early. I had him read the script, and I, I pitched to him what I thought the story was about. And uh, and as he was about to start working on it, he said, "Well, that's it's kind of interesting because." Um, I, I see a theme of lost and found throughout the movie. Characters are constantly being lost and either finding one another, or finding themselves and finding purpose and, mm -hmm. and you know, coming into, a, you know, departing um, in, in an important role, like in the case of Stoic. And, and so I had never really looked at the movie that way. Yeah. And it kind of, it, it, it sort of deepened my appreciation of John's value in the mix because he, he wasn't just going to score my understanding of the film, he was going yeah. to bring uh, kind of an, an alternative perspective to it. And I, I really loved what that brought in terms of richness and dimension. Absolutely. But at the same time, with, with any sequel, you have, to, you have to satisfy the, the reason people are coming back. Yeah. So, I mean, we, that was the great thing is, and I think it was uh, John, the editor, and, and you guys had already constructed pretty much that opening sequence of number two where all of the themes were back. Yeah, you know, it was they, like they, a they, get yeah. out of the bag, here they yeah. are. Type and I suddenly thing. realized, oh great, we get to do an overture and we get to reintroduce all the themes with everybody there before. And so that whole front section of the movie is, let's get back into this world. Here we are, I'm just gonna support that idea. Then the minute the actual, the new story started, which is, you know, um, hiccup looking at maps, because that's really where we're going. It's like, right. how, do I, how, do I end, how do I make my world bigger? This is, you know, somebody looking for change, looking for transition. That's when all the new themes start. And then, so I, I always took it as the way to do this is to use new themes for very specific reasons mm. uh, and use the old themes for very specific reasons because they match with something in the movie or they're about a return or they're about a development. But the new themes, I must link to the new, the new aspects of the story. Um, so yeah, we were talking about the we we're talking about the second film. Uh, the second film, what happened that I really thought was bold was having an on-screen character death, which has happened in, in animated films before. Um, but talk about handling that for especially for a film that's geared towards a PG audience. Um, how did you want that to come across, Dean? And what was the the impact that you wanted to have that? We were talking about Lost and Found, of course. Stoic dying is a loss for for Hiccup and. Mm -hmm. How did you want that to kind of factor into the story, and what was the effect you wanted? Well, I, I realized that the 
the relationship that people care most about and it's going to be featured foreground throughout all three films was the hiccup and toothless relationship right obviously there was some tension in the first film where they they were they were strangers they had to befriend one another come to trust one another come to each other's defense but when we jump five years within the narrative and begin dragon two they're you know they're intrepid explorers they're best friends they're ace flyers yeah they're it seems like they have this bulletproof relationship um they've been guarding each other's backs for five years now mm. uh, and it it just seemed to me that when i considered the the plot developments of the second film if there was no breakdown in their relationship it would flatline mm. it would seem kind of really uninteresting and so that became the greatest challenge of the movie. How do we take this bulletproof relationship and not only wrench it apart, um, but turn Toothless into Hiccup's enemy, uh, yeah. so much so that he would have killed him had his father not intervened. And, and to come back from that, to have Hiccup have faith in that friendship and to not give up on Toothless and and stick with him until he can draw him back would make that relationship stronger than ever. Uh, so long as we understand, we the audience understand that Toothless was not of sound mind in doing right. what it he wasn't did, that he was doing it on control. purpose. But it's still to see that the character kill Stoic, it's, it has a certain weight to it. Was there any reservations of, oh, is this going to be too heavy for children? Was there the studio ever going, maybe this is too much? There, there certainly was, yeah. I was under a lot of pressure to to change that element of the yeah. story. It, it, um, in the early days of the story, Valka was actually the, the sympathetic antagonist of the movie. Mm. And not only did he find his mother, this sort of kindred spirit, but she so distrusted human beings right. and had come to live with the dragons and be their defender that she was unmoving in that, in that ideology. And so it was a clash of coexistence versus segregation. Mm. And in the end, when she she, in the third act, she went to Burke to extract the dragons to get them to safety because this menace known as Drago and his army was coming. And she made it clear the Hiccup would have to make a decision. That was the, the first iteration of the story. And it actually went quite far before they said, listen, we can't have kids turning to their parents in the movie theater saying, why is, Hiccup mother, why is Hiccup's mother stealing the dragons? And why is Hiccup fighting his mother? Um, so I had to let go. They, they made me choose between these two ideas. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, is it is it toothless kill stoic or Valka is the villain? And I knew that the hiccup toothless relationship was important uh, to the core of the trilogy, more important. So I so I acquiesced and arced Valka much earlier and brought Drago in as a menace um, into the second film, so that we could protect that idea. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was. It was actually, I credit uh, Steven Spielberg for rising up to defend it because it, it came up very late in the game and Steven, Steven said, no, I like it. It's brave, it's bold, and it's... And, it is. And, and it, you, uh, those are the ones you remember. I mean, I remember Lion King, of course, when I'm younger, and of course, Land Before Time is very heavy in the beginning when, uh, you know, his mother dies. Finding Nemo. Finding Nemo. I yeah. mean, and Up. <laughs> you know, there's, yeah, sure. when, you, when you handle death in a certain way, I mean, it can be very sad but also poetic and beautiful and i think the way you, you guys handle it and john for the score i mean you we had all these beautiful bagpipes and now you kind of turned it into this you know this aggressive uh kind of thing towards in that you know with uh, drago yeah with drago but also for that scene to kind of bring the momentum but how did you handle that death scene musically as well that was actually an early thing we did because uh yonzi and i had had been um had had a play day to try and come up with something for the little uh, scene with Valka and Stoic, mm. remembering their wedding. So we had to write something for that. So we, we wrote a little thing for that, and that was fine. That was now in production. Everything got done on that. And I think um, you guys said, you know, we're working on the, the funeral. On the funeral, you know, is there anything you could you maybe have a go at that? And this was quite early. Um, so I, I got to take that theme. I thought this will this was the thing. I'll take that theme that they'd enjoyed in this moment and I'll make it his funeral music. Um, and so it's the same tune and, and, it, and then at, right at the very end it just turns. One of the things that, about that funeral was when I then came back to it, I, so I did that a little bit early, then there was a break and then I came back and had to, I did the whole film. 
and I realized what I'd done, which is I think moments like that in storytelling for me are kind of like pulling the bow back. Mm. Um, it, it's essentially, it states where, to me, it states the potential energy of where we're going. It's a big rubber band that's going to get pulled back um, to the moment, you know, with, with um, you know, with Hiccup and Toothless and he gets him back. So I had to work back from that moment. So every, everything you need to feel at the moment where he gets him back, really, I tried to pull back to the, the moment of the funeral. Mm. And it's, it's literally one idea of trying to, trying to get there. I mean, even though it wasn't constructed that way, but um, at the time, I, I realized that I was kind of, even though we had this music for the, the funeral, I had to build on that towards that moment of, right, his, right, right. of him getting him back. The, I mean, the, the series itself, it, it deals with a lot of mature themes. I mean, our main protagonist gets amputated in the first film, and, you know, it's so poetic because, you know, they're both kind of broken, but they complete each other, and then, of course, the death in the second one. The third one, you know, they're adults, and they're kind of coming into terms with themselves. There's a marriage, there's, a, a you know, an on-screen kiss. Um, did you ever felt like maybe this, did you ever, do you ever want, like, oh, this should have been, like, a PG-13, maybe more adult-oriented film? <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever felt limited by the PG rating? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's the nature of animation in this country. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, it's you're you're saddled with it, but that becomes a challenge as well to mm. kind of work within that and within that restriction. But you know, I I always long to be able to make films that are not constantly being held back for their for their maturity. Right. Um, yeah or for how scary something might be or how intense something might be. It, it tends to be my natural uh, tonal taste, you know, to, to kind of lean into something darker. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm constantly being, being pulled back. But, you know, there's a challenge in that as well. How do you make something that's really palpable for a larger audience and, and still be subversive, still be kind of challenging and pushing buttons without being gratuitous about it? Yeah, that's also important, I think, for those films to be for that audience as well, for kids of that age to experience those things because if that's just thing but sunshine sunshine and rainbows then you know <laughs> i feel like it's <laughs> yeah and then you have no emotional yeah, yeah. response i mean I, I think you do jeffrey katzenberg said i don't mind you going to a dark place but you have to bring us back yeah don't let the audience leave bummed out and and i think that was really good advice and i remember the movie opened on um, on father's day in 2014 right. yeah. and i was at a, a, an early promotional screening and somebody in the Q&A after the movie said, why would you release a movie on Father's Day and kill off the father? And, and I, I said, listen, I was 19 when my father died. And this is not a movie that, that is gratuitous in that sense. It celebrates fatherhood. It celebrates the sacrifice of parents yeah. and the nobility and the heroism of parents. And if you don't see that in the film, then you're missing the point. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's, it's, we didn't just kill a dad for no reason. Yes, yeah. Hiccup had to rise to fill those shoes. And if Stoic was there, he'd never really completely do it. Mm -hmm. There is a story function to it, but there's also what he left behind. That will continue to be the guiding voice for Hiccup going forward. We have an end goal in mind in the third film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is, a, this is a, a life event that's going to influence and inform Hiccup as he steps forward. Yeah. Why do you think we don't have more? Because you mentioned like you know, animation in America, it's you have it kind of stays at the PG level. We have a few PG thirteen ones that, off the top of my head, like Final Fantasy, um, Isle of Dogs, uh, but or stuff that kind of bombs usually. And then we have a few R rated ones that are really strictly for adults. But I feel like animation is would do so well in that PG thirteen kind of you know universal area. How come? studios aren't more willing to go there do you think is it just because you want to keep it for an audience and that's where the demographic is and that's where the money is going to come in but i think so i mean although of course animation the success of animation has been hugely dented by the success of marvel i mean that's the new they're an animation most they're like 50 percent animated 60 percent animated already. yeah but it's also the audience saturation True. that you yeah. get out of it yeah. so it has changed yeah. everybody i think in animation as to they have what the fuck are we supposed to do now they've become the new family film That's yeah. True. yeah 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 so yeah. where are where are we in animation can we we can't quite go up to that level of intensity well maybe we can i mean i think i think this could be the the answer is that um mm. you know if you're going to watch um 
you know the difficult the the difficult decisions that people make and the I mean obviously there's a lot more violence in those films which I I'm not very pleased about and I don't right. want animation to go that way right but, right um, but dealing with darker themes adult themes yeah, yeah absolutely but I think I think you know if you think of Bambi famously you know obviously killed the killed the mother straight away um, and Chuck Jones you know was always a, all of always about what can we the great thing about great animations is it's always been subversive Chuck Jones was always filling his movies with stuff for the adults because he knew that they would sit there and be sitting there and watching it as well right. I mean, that was what, Jeffrey mm -hmm. Katzenberg I remember very early on I remember him saying look you're not writing this music for for the kids you're writing this music for the parents who have to watch these movies over and over, oh, really? and, over and over again yeah, yeah. and I remember <laughs> thinking God, he's right. I, I need to actually put some effort into this because this, I wouldn't want to listen to, you know, shit music over and over and over again just because my child could, <laughs> you know. So I better write something fairly good, you know. The other thing is that we don't, like, we consciously do not second guess yeah. um, our audience. We, we're not trying to make a movie for youngsters. Yeah. We're yeah. trying to make a movie that we want to see. Right. Uh, so yeah. it's filled with as many things that drive me to the, the multiplex as an audience member. As there are elements that I that that, that will we know will entertain families and, and kids, so we we put every effort into trying to make the, the characters dimensional and authentic, and have moments that are sincere and tear jerking, because that's what makes that, that's what makes it kind of gratifying for us. Yeah, and those are the movies we want to see, and we just happen to be doing that in animation. <laughs> yeah. So there is a restriction in that you have to kind of keep the younger audience in mind. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to alienate them and or send them out, send you know, sort of crying or terrified out of the theater, and yet at the same time, you know, the the the, the medium itself um, can be elevated to to truly be like a like a, as they call it a four quadrant movie that yeah. speaks to adults as much as it does to kids. That's the challenge in it. Absolutely. What 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 do you both of you each love about animation that? you don't get in live action. Like, would, would the Dragon Trilogy work as a live action film with CG dragons? I mean, why, why, why was animation the perfect medium for this movie? The acting. The acting? I mean, I, this is the crazy thing, is that I think there's very, very few performances of acting in live action that have ever been, for me, as good as some of the great performances in animation. Mm. Um, I think the great, some of the greatest actors have been animators. They're not doing it the way that you traditionally think of it, but uh, I see more uh, of the the pantomime of humanity yeah. that can go on in a face. I've seen it more in in animated characters, and a lot of them out of DreamWorks um, on these films that that say um, that that speak in such a complex level. Uh, the great animation can do that. Great actors occasionally can do it. Um, so the great thing is you have to get lucky with an actor and they have to do the right take and everything it has to be perfect like that with animation as a control freak I love the idea of that because you can keep going back and you can keep working on it until it's <laughs> yeah. absolutely perfect every little yeah. thing is created you know, I mean you've probably had to swap swap animators on on shots because mm -hmm. certain animators are gonna get it and some aren't you know some can do really good animation but for this moment I need this person because they do it and suddenly it all comes to light and you understand not what the character says but you understand everything above below and beyond and ahead of it mm. it becomes it becomes a dimension uh, of the language of art I mean I think that's why I've always liked animation and I probably understood it as a child and the difference between uh, Hanna-Barbera sorry you know in Scooby-Doo that's not animation for me Hanna-Barbera doing Tom and Jerry you know that's animation yeah so those facial expressions, those moments in Tom and Jerry where a lot goes through everybody's head in the character, just simply because the animators were genius about it. That's what I was interested in. And when I would watch at the same age, you know, these other things that they made, I just didn't understand them because there was none of that. It was like, it was, it was like watching everybody with Botox. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's animation for me. <laughs> Dean, for you, what is your take on animation? What does it bring versus live action? Would you ever do live action? I'd love to do live action. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd love to like have the full toolbox. Yeah, <laughs> and and to you know customize the medium to the story. Mm. Uh, that said, 
animation is um, it's it's one hundred percent creation. Nothing exists. You yeah. know, there's no backlog with props. Right. Uh, everything, every performance, every blade of grass has to be created, and so mm. uh, it's been this wonderful. Uh, kind of mind-blowing evolution for me. I started on in 2008 on How to Train Your Dragon. It was the first CGI movie I had worked on. Everything before that had been hand-drawn. That's right, yeah. Um, and my mind was blown with just texture and detail and and and, uh, and, and also what Roger Deakins brought to the process. It's amazing it that you had so. Roger on board to yeah. do that I mean, because the visuals, especially in this third one, I mean, the, the fire, the lights, everything. is. You see how the animation get better, of course, as technology is getting better, but this third film, what you did visually was amazing. Like, yeah. the, the hidden world itself, how everything comes alive, the way light falls on characters. It's uh, It feels real, but it also, you know it's not real because it feels animated. It's kind of, your brain is in this world, but it's just, I don't know, it's just fantastic. Yeah, he, he set a challenge that uh, the artists really rose to, mm -hmm. and our production designer and our visual effects supervisor. Um, they've, they've all done marvelous work because of this uh, liberty to do something that stepped outside of the norm of animation, to strive for something that was kind of a, a mid-ground between live action and, a, and yeah. established animation. Uh, but yeah, if, for, for me it's just, the fact that you can create anything you can dream up now yeah. is pretty mind-blowing. And you have no restrictions of, of uh, space, you know, physical restrictions of, of sets and what, what you could conceivably build or how you would suspend somebody from wires or whatnot. <laughs> like, you, you do have the ability to actually create, at this point, uh, anything yeah, that you can yeah. dream up and articulate to a group of people. So that's pretty amazing. So when it came time to enter this, the third and final film, I mean, that must have been exciting to be like, we're finally here because you kind of been planning for it. Um, what was the, uh, how, how did the films evolve to this point? Like what, what was the third film? Was it any different than the first two in terms of not just the, the movie itself, but just the approach? Did you guys change anything for this one to be like, okay, we learned some from mistakes in this one. Let's change it up for this one. I, I think for me, the the second film, even though it made the most money worldwide, was deemed a bit of a, a disappointment. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, I, I we had a sit down where... A where, creative uh, disappointment or financial disappointment? Uh, both. Really? Yeah. Wow. Because I went a little too dark with it, in their opinion, and that held uh. it back from being, you know, a billion dollar movie um, in their in their minds. So, yeah, I remember, I remember being told, it's not a failure. It's just disappointing. So I, I felt a little. I felt the faith that had been entrusted in me for the for the choices, yeah. uh, especially the more controversial choices of the second film, were haunting me in the third. And I felt the the pressure to let the tone return to the levity of the first movie, mm. uh, which was okay. I think I planned to kind of go that direction anyway. But fairly early on, some of the the vestigial elements like Drago had kind of a, a sea story within the movie, mm. um, a, a redemption story. And that, and the story itself was a little more slavish to the continuity of the second film. And we were kind of on our way. I mean, we were, we were, we had fully storyboarded the film and, and uh, Jeffrey had a moment where he just said, I think it was in the wake of, um, how to, of sorry, Kung Fu Panda 3. Uh -huh. And it didn't do as well as they all hoped it would. Right. And he became convinced that it was because they were not offering up enough new mm. to drive audiences to to the cinemas. Uh, it felt like more of the same, and so so he reread the script and and he said, "Listen, we need to we need to sort of jettison a lot of the the slavish continuity mm. and put in ideas that we can market, that we can put in trailers that are going to drive people to the audience, uh, sort of to the cinemas." Yeah. So I and I get it. I thought it was a you know a great bit of advice, and I'd wished it had come earlier. But I went away and sequestered myself um, in, in an apartment up at Skywalker Ranch for a month, and I rewrote it from scratch. Oh, wow. And this was you know, a good year and a half into the process. Wow, so yeah. it was right around the time that, that uh, DreamWorks was, it was announced that DreamWorks was being sold to Universal right. or to Comcast. Uh, but it, yeah, it was this contained space where I could just kind of go into my own fanboy head and inject it with a bunch of new stuff and fun stuff. And that became that became the script that we made. And for the 
what I noticed about this film, at least musically, John, is like you're always you've always wonderfully used chorus and 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 the human voice as an instrument. But I really found that the way you used chorus and this was so beautiful and and kind of especially towards the end. And um, do you want, can you talk about I guess your approach for for this film and did it differ at all? How did it, how did it differ? Of course it differed, but how did it differ than the past the past two? I don't know. It's funny people have said that, and I uh, I have to look at it because. I thought I used chorus quite a lot on number one and number two. Oh, you did, you know. yeah, yeah. So did I use chorus a lot more on number three? I think the answer is maybe I did it better. Uh, and maybe I did it better. I went off in the time being and I, and I did an album of, um, of choral music. I do think that that... You know, so uh, yeah, I probably learned yeah. a Just from me looking tricks, at your work, yeah, I think I yeah. see a, when you did your chorus works, like I, f I felt a, a shift. I don't know, just from my personal opinion. Yeah, no, I, it yeah. probably is. I mean, just getting to go out and get crazy with the chorus and, and learn a bit you know, more about how to use them. Um, and I come back to this film and, I, and it's, a, it's not something that was new to the third one, but it certainly maybe... Was a, I, was a tool that I was feeling more confident with. I also think that it had uh, a few, a few moments that f that had been stripped down and simplified so that the choral elements were were more prominent. And they leave they leave more of like for example the village hymn during the wedding. It yeah. kind of has yeah. a strong lasting impact. Oh, for sure. Or the yeah. way that you'd used Yonzi in uh, the the initial exploration of the hidden world, like the mm. the the sparsity. Yeah had, um, I, I think it just emphasized the impact of the choral elements. But I mean, I'd like to think that I'm just maturing like the characters in the film. <laughs> uh, that my writing is maturing a bit. I'm finally kind of getting, this is the irritating thing about getting old, is I'm finally getting the hang of this. <laughs> <laughs> you wish you could rewind 30 years? You know? Oh, fuck yeah, I'd be really good. <laughs> to have that energy, but a bit of the kind of, the knowledge that I've got now, it'd be great. So do you think you're, you, do you think you two are better storytellers now than you were on the first film? Like if you had to give yourself a, a self-review? <laughs> do, you, do you feel different? Do you feel like you've changed at all in those 10 years or 12 years? Well, changed in that I, 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 I you know, I, I know him and trust him yeah. and encourage him to, to um, kind of go off in his own direction, like follow his own drive, not wait for, for, for me or feel held back by me. So, like, if I was going to do another film, I'd, I'd love for John to write the music to it, just because I feel like he's a true partner, you know. And we've gotten past the getting to know you process. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a full-on marriage now. So, oh, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> but also, it's not fair to say this because remember, the first one was the first one. Yes. The third one was the third of three. Right. So, could we have fucked up the third one of three ten years ago? Maybe more easily, yeah, right. you know. Mm -hmm. But was the was anything wrong with the first one? It was the first one. It had all of that kind of just the intuition, maybe that is as matured. Right. But it still had the intuition. So I think I think you know, just sitting in that restaurant in, in you know, mm -hmm. by, it was it was like one of those restaurants that's kind of like I'll always, I'll always remember it. It was it was one of those sort of mall restaurants in a mall that was in a mall that had a mall around it uh, and somewhere out in the valley or somewhere like that and it, and it, and you know there was a mall within the cinema and we were and mall people were coming to watch the film and everything about it was kind of this system that you don't that has no romance no none of the romance of the idea none of the romance of of those moments where you think this is how brilliant ideas are born it, none of that it was so mundane it was so mundane but at that time the movie got better after that screening and everybody sat around and just kind of like thought what the hell do we how do we make this better which a is a great thing for everybody not to go ah they loved it great we're done yeah. you know I think to make it that step in such a mundane place, I, I, I'll always remember that as you know this idea that great great art is is created in in beautiful places and <laughs> with great inspiration around it. No, <laughs> often it's just in a mall restaurant. <laughs> I remember there was a moment uh, before we really got started. John and I sat at the same table on a night that the AFI was honoring John Williams. Oh yeah, yeah, mm. and uh, and. 
John leaned over to me at one point and he said, I have two thoughts for this third film. One, I would love for the temp score not to include any of my music. Okay. And again, because we did, we failed at that in the second film. <laughs> uh, and that he wanted to try to record with full orchestra as much as possible, mm. which is yeah. sort of, it was not really your process. No, it wasn't. And, um, and we fulfilled both of those things. But I can, I can actually confess now that we're done, we had two versions of the temp score. One was filled with John Powell music, and then there was the one that we kept on, on hand really? for when you came by. Yeah. Oh my <laughs> God, you motherfuckers. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, I've been telling everybody, yeah, they've been so good, they just didn't use me. They didn't use any of the some sort of, it's great, it's great. He yeah. took my advice. It's no, apparently he didn't take my advice. He just, well, thank you. Yeah, but, you know. <laughs> no, but even in the process of doing that, I'd like to think that the fact you knew I'd be really kind of like, what? Um, you... You probably still at least didn't fall in love with the temp too much, which was good. No. I hope. Yeah. Well, I get from right. Dean's point of view, if I had Absolutely. that music yes, course, to, yeah. add, to craft, uh, yeah, to get a picture right. of the feeling, I would dip into yeah. that pool 100%. No, of course. <laughs> Actually, I, I was always thinking, wow, they're so, they're so, uh, you know, self-restrained about this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now I know. No, All it takes is a glass of wine and you find out the truth. Shady and deceptive. <laughs> are there any other secrets we can get out here now? <laughs> oh, wow. Well, now, the only, the only other thing I remember kind of in, insisting on when we first got together for the third film was I just said, this is your last shot. Like, the same thing I told the animators and everybody yeah. else. It's just, if there's anything you ever wanted to get into this world and this trilogy, now's your last shot. So mm -hmm. it was kind of a, a you know... An ambitious call to arms, yeah. Just, just to say, you know, don't, don't feel sort of boxed in by all of the music you've already created for the first two installments. Um, and and sure enough, John saved them for the most impactful moments, like to bring back a theme that the audience is, at least the fans would be aware of and anticipating. I think it had a really strong effect by by showing restraint. I really, I mean, the, the the whole score itself, the way, I mean, I think it's just structured so beautifully. And my, I really love the track Third Date, which is when Toothless and they have that, you know, the little the song and dance going back and forth of kind of trying to say, woo the love interest for him. And the way you did it was so playful and so fun. But, I mean, it reminded me, actually, um, of your score for Endurance. For mm. There's little touches there. I was like, this reminded me of, of Endurance, which I love, which is one of my favorite scores of yours. Um, but talk about... Um, I guess both of you, when you have you have some new characters, when you have new characters coming in into the world, how do you treat it, I guess, from a story point of view, and how do you treat it musically when you have, I, mean, I guess it's just a new musical element that you just weave into the to the soundscape of what come before? Yeah, it was tricky, actually, because um, they had tempt forbidden friendship into that scene, mm. and it, it kind of did work, in a way. Mm. What... What was hard for me was to look at it objectively and not think, oh, that's not working because I want to write something new. Um, and to really find, try and figure out why I thought it was, wasn't working, to bypass my ego. Um, and, and I just, I remember just going back and taking a run at it and having a look at it. And I remember thinking, in the greater scheme of things, I think, even though, yeah, this is an echo, of that moment on the beach with so it's a different relationship yeah, yeah it really is a different relationship and i think even though we got a lot of emotional value out of putting in forbidden friendship there what we didn't get was we didn't get the new the sense of the the exciting sense of love which is not what we had to create in forbidden friendship yeah, yeah. that was a di it was a different emotion ultimately this was more about the the jitters of to tell you the truth, sex. Yeah. I just thought I need to, I need to show, uh, you know, at least what I feel about those moments of the the possibilities of the frisson of. Yeah. No, you, you get know, the, the, of, the the butterflies. Yeah. 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 The, the, the kind know. of the flutter. The flutter. Yeah. The flutter is the perfect yeah. word. Yeah. And even though we had a little bit, you know, there's a little bit that is implied in the animation of, of Forbidden Friendship. That is ultimately what it is. It's the difference between sex and friendship, I think, really. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you can't really talk about that very out loud because it's, it's an animated <laughs> yeah, film and it's exactly. kids and it's two dragons, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, I think that's where I felt the tone was 
could be different. Mm -hmm. and, that, and then I tried to find a way of doing that, and I just had a chunk of it. And that was one thing that I played to everybody and said, what if it was just a little bit more light on its feet? Mm -hmm. But then, of course, once I'd done that, I realized it was hard because I had to, I had to try and get some of the emotional impact back. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. Of the loss of her at the end of it, and uh, so it was a, that was a hard one to do. But when you landed it, it was one hundred percent clear. I remember he played back. He had tried a couple of different explorations, mm -hmm. and then it was the third go. And we sat down. It was a completely new piece of music, but he played it through once, sort of loosely to picture. Yeah. And and I just like, done. It's it. That's it. It's amazing. It's because it had that immediately recallable. Um, melody to it, and it's the one that sticks in my head a lot. That one, mm -hmm. and then the the wedding, the chorus there, kind of. I will, but it's like an earworm. I'll, I'll stick in my head for a few days. I have to listen to stuff to get it out. But <laughs> <laughs> I love, and I I love the the hidden world theme. Like oh, by the time you see yeah. uh, Toothless and Light Fury together on that on that perch, mm -hmm. from Hiccup's point of view, that that's just such a. To me, that sounds like you're walking into the theme park attraction. You know, <laughs> yeah. it has this <laughs> iconic, uh, important, <laughs> all enveloping, rich theme to it. How, so how do you know when when you when you say that's it? Like, is it just a gut instinct that you know that that's no more, no nothing else has to be done? I, for me, it is. Yeah, I mean, it, it is it is great. I mean, I think you know, you body language can tell you a lot. It depends on the character of people. I mean, yeah. um, you know, it, it's funny on, on solo. Ron Howard is is fantastic. He's he's the easiest to read director in the world. It's like if he sits there. And his, and his eyebrows move up and down, you have not succeeded. Because it's really simple, because if it works, he's jumping around. It's great. Yeah, you yeah, can yeah, tell, yeah. absolutely jumping around. It's like that, you know. Um, you're not quite as easy to read, because I have to wait to the end to actually see what you're gonna say about it. But you know, you normally just kind of have a big grin on your face and you go, uh, yeah, that's it. I'm an internal ingester as well. Like people make fun of me when I see movies. Like you're not laughing, you're not like smiling. I just usually sit there and I watch a movie with my arms crossed, and then afterwards I'm like, oh yeah, I really loved it. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. Really is it? Do you still? Is it nervous to present your work? I mean, absolutely. Like even even to Dean, you know him so well, oh, it's still nerve wracking. Especially to Dean. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> because you know you're going to get the truth, <laughs> and you you know, it, albeit and unfortunately a nice Canadian pleasant way um, <laughs> but you are going to get the truth because you know people could he, he's going to react and he's going to tell me what what his real his real feelings are about it and I he's not going to be polite to me when he knows it's not working in some way right. so I, I know it has to either work or not and but one of the great things about that is you can say okay well look I'm going to play you something I'm really not sure about and we'll see what happens you know, and the faith is there that is that he's not going to take that as this guy doesn't know what he's doing, because at that moment I don't about that I don't, and I'll say it, and it's perhaps a dangerous thing to say with somebody you know unless you know them well, but if you don't know what you're doing, just be a collaborator. And it's like, can you sit there and just listen to this because I just want to see what your reaction is to it. Um, it doesn't mean I don't know what I'm doing, but it means that I'm not sure what this is yet. Yeah. And the idea that I'm not sure what this is, that obviously, it's music. The problem with music is it's, it's untenable. It's, you cannot really quite put your finger on it. You certainly can't say it. So that's why body language and, you know, it takes 12 words to describe something that's wrong or right about it. Right. Um, and, and I must say, Dean always finds a, sort of a really elegant set of words that I think if I put them in a big circle around, around it, it, it suddenly starts to make sense mm. as to why it's not working or why it is working. And, and if it is working, you want to know that because it's not finished. Yeah, you still have yeah. to finish it, you still have to make <laughs> it work. But knowing that it's kind of working means it, it's, you know, as I say, it's an elliptical answer. You, you, you know, you're surrounding it and eventually trying to get to the, the bullseye. Absolutely. And it's 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 very brave, you know. I think like um, any any artist who kind of puts something out there that that is a representation of of themselves, but yeah. uh, is uncertain about it. So you ha I think you have to receive that with you know with the trust that it's put forward with. And, yeah. And, and 
reflect that. Right. You know? So I, I think, um, like for me, music is magic. I, I, I don't play any instruments. I have no musical aptitude, yeah. but I have great appreciation for it. Absolutely. And I think that's what makes it more magical is that I see, uh, I see images in music and, yeah. and it, it propels creativity for me. Uh, so, so when I'm presented with something that is um, an idea, you know, not not fully flushed out, but an idea, I, I'm very, like, I'm very thankful for that. Yeah. Because I, I feel like here's an artist presenting something that is unfinished and he's uncertain about, mm -hmm. and I, I do my best then to be to if I if I see something or don't see something, I try to articulate it in a way that isn't. Uh, that isn't going to be damaging. Or, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I only want to be additive. Absolutely, I mean the. I mean the. Just the. You're both writers, uh, and I think just the writing process is such a vulnerable. You go into such a vulnerable state. You be. I mean that a lot of people do it alone. And it's a private thing, and um, I'm just curious if when you're writing, whether you're writing the screenplay or you're writing the score, do you do you draw from like if you need to find a certain emotion, whether it's happy or sad or tragic or horror or do you draw back on on life experiences or stuff I mean, you mentioned your father passing away i just interviewed alan silvestri and he told me a great story of when he wrote that run forest run moment his son was born uh with uh, diabetes and they thought they were going to lose him and that moment in his life is what fueled him to see somebody on screen becoming unbroken and it, it gave him hope for himself and i thought does, that, does it come into your lives? Do you pull from your lives for these kind of deeper emotions? Or is it more about putting on a, a role and kind of finding that within the characters? I think it's both. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, if, you, if you have a life experience that kind of lends itself towards something you're, you're putting up on screen that has some similarity to it, mm -hmm. then leaning into it gives it specificity. And, and there's usually truth and authenticity in that. Yeah. Um, but... Just as often, it's sort of me fantasizing about, you know, right, being right. in that position, or, or trying to create this own this this wish fulfillment that goes back to my youth, or, um, so yeah, it's a mix of bullshit and authenticity, I think. Yeah, yeah. It is dangerous for composers, and I've been guilty of it. And it, you know, you can use the same emotional memories that you have to sort of inspire you. Right. But in theory, that's on the screen, and you need to be inspired by that. If the danger of using your own personal sort of memories is that you think this is the saddest piece because you're connecting it with your own personal right. sad memories. The viewer doesn't know that and they're, they're not connected with that. If the picture isn't connected with it, if the story isn't and if this tune does not fit with that, <laughs> then you're creating a false mm. uh, impression of what the emotion of it is. Uh, and I've seen directors do it themselves uh, and I've seen me do it myself. Um, and it's very dangerous, you, you know, so trying to get it to be authentic. I mean, I, I, you know, music is really weird. Yeah, it's yeah. really weird the way it works. I, went, I just went to see uh, Amazing Grace, Have you, uh, see, which is a mm. documentary film about the making of Amazing Grace, the album by Aretha Franklin. It's an extraordinary film because it's like watching the birth of, it's like watching a film of something you never thought would ever be filmed. And Sidney Pollock made it, and he, they were running around trying to capture this thing. And I, I went to see it, and I sat there, and there's a great sort of entrance of the, of the choir and a preparation of everything else like that. Aretha Franklin's introduced, and she's deadly serious, pretty much deadly serious the whole film. And she sits down, she starts to play, she opens her mouth, and I'm bawling. Mm. I, start, I started crying, and <laughs> the person I was with was like, why are you crying? You're an atheist. Just like, I know, I don't know. Why are you crying? I don't know. Yeah. It was gospel music, and I was yeah. cried for an hour and a half as this thing was happening in front of me and I'm watching it. And I hadn't cried necessarily at the album. I knew the album. Yeah. It's wonderful stuff. But it wasn't until I saw her do it that it, it suddenly became a, a, a supernatural thing. No, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, although it's ultimately the most human thing I've ever seen. Um, and this, this young woman who was at the top of her game, admittedly, but she was still so kind of delicate. She seemed delicate until she opened her mouth and then the meaning of the universe suddenly <laughs> appeared. Yeah, yeah. And I reacted very viscerally to it. And it was nothing to do with any, I never even heard a word anyone said. I didn't need to because it was all obliterated by 
some meaning within the actual the tone, the expression, the melody, the the structure, the form, everything that I I guess I've always reacted to with music. So it was a, it was a, one of those really profound moments that reminds me of why why it's worth keeping to try keep trying to create music. Absolutely no, I mean for me when I fell in love with the medium, because uh, I. I my, my parents thought I was going to become like a marine biologist. I was really into animals or something, but I don't know when I was younger and you have those, you know, growing up is tough and you have those moments of depression and stuff. I, I found myself making the most sense of life by living it through like movies and seeing how other people examine different emotions, different relationships. And mm. like, I'm like, this is the only thing that makes sense to me. Like I could be a doctor or physician and, or, you know, a rocket scientist or an astronaut, but it's like, I don't know, this makes sense to me. So I don't know. It's... Well, I, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, I mean, George Miller, when I went to work with him, you know, he said, he was the one who said to me, he was, well, you know what filmmaking is? And I, I suddenly realized, well, I don't think I do actually. What was it? <laughs> he goes, well, it's, 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 um, it's group therapy. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we all get in a in a darkened room, and we have this therapy session where we see ourselves through all these other characters, and we see our own lives, and we see the we see our lives fail and succeed, or succeed and fail, and that it is possible to it is possible to get over the the, the terrible things that, and it's possible to enjoy the wonderful things, or you know, you really experience everything that you really want to talk about, but is impossible to talk about. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It was, for, you can be a, you can feel not alone, even though you're alone, you feel not alone. It's like, oh, somebody wrote this, somebody went through these emotional things, yeah. you can put yourself yeah. in that point, yeah. and it's like, oh, I, it's okay to feel this way, or I want to feel maybe this way, and I can jump into that world or something. Yeah, so. music does that better than anything. Exactly. Yeah. It's so vague, it's so wonderfully vague, you can read anything you like into it. Yeah. I mean, the great, great films are like that. The, they, you know, they work at a level which is not what you're seeing. Yeah. They're not about what you're hearing or what you're watching, or what people are saying. It's, it's wonderful when you suddenly realize there's a whole, there's a whole level of communication going on here which is, not, which is not actually what anybody's saying. So, but with that, I'd also like to, you know, just add that we don't think we're like, you know, I think both of us are, are pretty much into, you know, don't come over as a bunch of pretentious Hollywood types. No, not at all. Who think they're fucking geniuses <laughs> and uh, saving the world. I mean, I'm really just trying to make a living here. I don't know about you. I mean, it's something to aspire to, right? I remember seeing... Absolutely. That's the seeing, trick. Um, inspired. The Dead, Dead Poet Society actually changed my outlook. Oh, wow. Like on life, you know? I came out of that film thinking I'd never perceived life in that way. Yeah. And, and it made me conscious with every... You know every sort of decision I made yeah. that, that you know you could you could be a conformist or you could try to do something different, um, and yeah. Most recently, Boyhood had this like profound effect on me so much so I never want to see it again. Yeah, like it had a, yeah. it was so pure that I don't want to break it down. I don't want to understand it any more than than the visceral effect that it left. And so, so I, I suppose I carry that ambition with me. Like I would love to affect somebody in a pure and genuine way, not just yeah. entertain them, but Absolutely. actually. No, I mean, you, everyone carries those movies that you ask. What, uh, that's the first thing you talk about when you meet somebody. What's your favorite music? What's your favorite movie? Yeah. Your favorite book or whatever. And it's kind of defined. People define themselves with with the stories that we all watch. And I think storytelling is the best way to explore the human condition, at least uh, I've seen so far in my lifetime. But like, <laughs> but I think the thing that people don't realize about music is I think it's the same. I mean, I think I, I realized that I learned that f symphon symphonies were stories. Yeah, yeah. And... They're just very vague stories, um, but they are. It is the, exactly the same. I see, I see characters, and I see the imagery of, of the difficulties and the wonders of life. Mm. In, I've I've always heard flying. Ironically, I mean, I think I've always heard flying in music. There's the, certain types of music always feel like that. That's that feels like flying. It feels like you're, you've left the ground. You have freedom. You have everything you could ever want, and you have the the beauty of the earth, and yet, you know, it's just somebody with a guitar or a full orchestra going or a voice. Yeah. So, so kind of touching back to Hidden World, uh, when you when it came time to close everything down, the, that, that final resol resol resolution scene, the the wedding, um, the where where did dragons come from? That kind of, and then seeing Hiccup, we would do a little flash forward, and then we see him, he has a family and everything. How did you, I mean, musically, I love how you closed everything. I think that was the perfect, just like, 
you know, period at the end of the sentence. And it was so perfect. I mean, you brought in some themes. You brought, I think the forbidden friendship theme came back there. Mm-hmm. What was the, the... And then test flight. Test flight. Then... So you kind of get a little bit of a reprise of everything. And, yeah. um, but you, it still felt so... With the chorus, again, I mentioned the chorus. It felt fresh and, and to that film. What was the kind of approach for closing everything out? I, it, it was hard. It, it was about sort of restraint of making sure that the stuff we were going to use at the end really was ripe and ready to go uh, and not to have overused it and where were the right moments to use it. Right. Okay, so, but that's, that's easy compared with them making sure that the road to that is paved with the right material and it's all new material as yeah. well. Um, so where I couldn't rely on any of that stuff because I was holding it so dearly holding it back for these things so I had to make sure that all of the other material that we were, we had would get us to that point and would mean the right things just within the context of that one film mm. so it, it proved to be very very tricky and Dean yeah. so story-wise how did you want what was the your intent what did you want the film to do with that with the closure but also kind of leaving us on that <clears throat> so we did see them separate but we do see them for that little moment they get to his children get to experience Toothless for a little bit, and we have we do leave on a high note. Yeah, and I, I think that was customized for our audience, yeah. knowing that we were we were catering to a family audience. We didn't. I think the more mature version of this movie is Hiccup standing on the cliff, surrounded by Astrid and the others, watching the dragons leave for good. Yeah, yeah I think that's credits. Yeah, yeah, like that. That's the more mature version of it. But we knew that we didn't want to bum the audience out. We wanted to kind of send them out with a smile and, and reassurance and and take a little bit of the um, the, the bitter yeah. and, and replace a little more of the sweet. So one of the, I think one of the inspirations behind this movie was uh, Born Free. And in Born Free, the uh, the human couple come back after 10 years and they, they fire off the shotgun that would always bring Elsa the lion to them. And sure enough, she returns with cubs. Uh-huh. And you see the male kind of sitting up on the rock guarding over them and you realize they thrived. Just, you know, all of all of their work to try to reintroduce this lion into the wild worked. Right, right. Um, and it had this kind of warm hug. It was like Christian and the lion. You know, there's there's a there's a warm hug of of recognition. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even though the decision to return the animal to the wild was emotionally distressing, ultimately it was the right. You know, you're reassuring the audience uh, that it was the right decision. So not only do we get to see Hiccup and Astrid and their family. You know, how they thrived independent of Toothless, but you get to see that Toothless thrived with his own family. Yeah, yeah. So I think that in itself is like, it just puts a smile on people's faces. And the moment they see those baby dragons is, you know, you can hear audiences coo. And so it made sense that the music should celebrate it in the same way. You know, just <laughs> kind of bring it back, the warm hug of, of the, the most iconic music of the trilogy, sort of wrapping it all up and feeling like a... A beautiful little coda. Yeah, I think it, I think it worked very because yeah, I think when you mentioned like oh, it would that would be the point to cut it off. They don't see each other anymore because like you know at the end of E. T. Elliot doesn't grow up and go visit E. T. You mm-hmm. know with the children, but I still think it worked beautifully. I think even though if it was catering to a certain audience, I still it still affected me too. And I was like oh, I thought this was gonna be felt tacked on, but it felt so natural and organic. So I think it worked out really well. Okay, glad to hear yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the things that when I first saw it for the first time is I. Because I didn't know that was coming, yeah. And I'm watching the whole film without music. I kept thinking as we got to the end. I kept thinking, and here we go into test drive, which is like, that. no, 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 I can't do that there. That's, that's, I've still got a bit long to go. <laughs> now here I go into test drive. No, no, I need to wait there. Okay, there's a bit more coming. There's a bit more coming, coming. You know, and I suddenly realised, all right, I really need to leave this a bit longer. Uh-huh. And so, seeing that, knowing that we had that on there, that was that was even more about that that's where I need to save that for. I mean, we do use it as obviously as the light fury saves hiccup and that felt good to do that. Mm-hmm. There. Then we have this, we have enough of a space to then get it back again for the very end. Um, and that's where actually lost and found came in very useful is, is cause there was this instinct that first of all I had was to as, as you know, as um, hiccup and toothless were kind of literally you know, recreating the moment of of, of uh, forbidden friendship. There's the danger. You think, okay, well, maybe I should put danger, you know, forbidden friendship there. 
But again, I didn't need that, and that's where Lost and Found came in useful. I guess. Yeah. That's what I did there instead. Well, I think it was uh, a beautiful film, the beautiful trilogy. Um, I was just looking back at it, was there anything that we haven't covered that maybe are any memories that stick out as something special or something ridiculously difficult or funny, anything from the whole journey that you look back on? I, I would just say for me personally that the experience of going to the recording with an assembled orchestra at either you know Air yeah. Studios or Abbey Road is like I wish everybody in the world could experience that. It is pure magic. And I know he's working, he's super focused yeah. and, and listening for every every possible sort of error or anomaly in the music. But to to a layman like myself, just to be able to hear, you know, this this custom designed score. To your story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, set to the imagery of the movie we've been working on and replacing the temp we've sort of become so used to and tired of. And like it's a fresh coat of paint, and it's a an enrichment of the story and this kind of uh, new dimension to it all. And it's being done live in front of you with these super talented musicians. Uh, it, it's a uh, it, it is truly magical. Like it's the best part of the filmmaking process. And so much of this is is a lot of fun, but that is really amazing. I wish everybody could experience it. <laughs> I mean, that's really that's really interesting that. You know, all those years with James Horner, the Don Bluth, he's doing that. I feel that then when I'm, what, 19, 20. Uh, and then I'm all these years later, I'm there doing exactly the same thing as James Horner was doing. But in a way, I don't get to experience that because yeah. I, it's a job at that point and you have to focus. It's my role. I have a contract with DreamWorks that say, <laughs> you know I have to make everything as good as I possibly can it's my role to absolutely just be really focused and make sure we get everything the right way so that when we turn up the dub it's all going to sound right and everything you know so I, I it's interesting you hearing you say that because I, I in a way I get to lose a little bit of that experience of coming back to the magic of it because it is magical getting the you know huge orchestra play play this music so um, I must try and remember to do that more just take a moment for myself and remember yeah yeah <laughs> Well, uh, Dean, John, thank you so much thank for you. chatting. This is so much fun. It's just to go back on a little memories, uh, memory lane down the walk memory lane. But uh, uh, I really love the films, and congratulations on what's well, something rare these days is having a complete three arc story. You know, now it's about let's keep it going as much as we can. But to have a perfect three <laughs> trilogy is, is something that you know, I grew up watching the trilogies, and so it was a, a big thing for a trilogy. Now it's like, oh, Marvel was on twenty two already, but it's like. <laughs> Right. So yeah. thank you for giving us these films. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for being such an awesome support over the years, Kaya. You're, uh, of you're really great. I love, I love tuning into everything you do. Oh, thanks so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you.